we'll hear from our speakers first, and um, then uh, please keep your uh, questions, uh, post your questions already in the Q&A during the presentations, and then we'll soon have the opportunity to discuss. Um, so the speakers of today are Frances Foley. She's the deputy director of COMPASS, uh, where she works on progressive alliance building around the topics of democracy, equality, and climate. And she was formerly project director of the Citizens Convention on UK Democracy, a project to design and campaign for a constitutional convention for the UK. And she has helped facilitate a number of uh, citizens assemblies in the UK. And our second speaker is Alan Renwick. He's the professor of democratic politics and deputy director of the constitution unit at UCL. His research focuses on the conduct of elections, referendums, and on deliberative processes such as citizens assemblies. Among others, he led the project of the citizen assembly on Brexit in uh, 2017. And he's just finished running the citizens assembly on democracy in the UK. Um, Francis, you have written a brand new report on the role and functioning of citizens assemblies in the UK and in the Republic of Ireland. And um, what can you tell us? What were your main findings on citizens assemblies and how they are integrated into the current political system? Yeah, thanks, Joanna. And thanks very much to the FAS for uh, kicking all of this off and uh, bringing the conversation about citizen assemblies um, wider of the, uh, you know, more of the agenda and, and getting people to be thinking and talking about them. Um, yeah, so the report, um, I was asked to, to, to do the report by FAS because we were talking about the fact that uh, in the last few years in the UK, as many of you will also know, uh, there have been a kind of proliferation of citizen assemblies and we've been talking and thinking about deliberative democracy um, much more kind of acutely and with much more focus. I think what's been interesting is also to see that the media has kind of cottoned on to that. Um, we had the amazing process in the Republic of Ireland, which is still ongoing around the constitutional sort of assemblies we've seen there. But actually in the UK, the past, I would say, you know, five years, if you talk to deliberative um, practitioners and campaigners and facilitators, they've really noticed this kind of deliberative turn, which I speak about in the report. Um, the report sets out a bit of the kind of context for that and maybe some of the reasons that we've seen the kind of rise of citizen assemblies. And certainly there's been a bit of a kind of snowballing effect of councils deciding to run a citizen assembly, getting some good coverage and hopefully also some good outcomes from it. And then other councils kind of picking up the baton and doing the same thing. But what I wanted to kind of raise in this session is, is maybe the kind of more contentious things that my report kind of touches on, or maybe areas which are a bit more of a challenge, both to the deliberative and citizen assembly community, and also to the wider public and people who in general care about democracy in the UK, what role do citizen assemblies play? Um, I think it's fair to say that most people who are kind of democratic, democratically engaged and thinking about politics in its wider sense and understanding the kind of challenges of disaffection and alienation we face in the UK and across the world actually around democracy, have welcomed citizen assemblies as um, fresh and kind of interesting, uh, nuanced, they bring a lot of kind of thoughtfulness and they show citizens at their best, kind of working to solve problems and being an active part of the uh, policy making process. But I think there were three kind of key things that my report found. And just to say that the report was based on a series of interviews that I conducted with practitioners and designers of um, uh, citizen assemblies, also with uh, politicians and representatives who had commissioned them or been part of them. And also I spoke to some people who had participated in citizen assemblies as well, and that was, that was really interesting. So the report was based on all of those interviews and there were a number of different ideas and opinions flying around, but I tried to condense it all into some kind of key lessons, both for the sector here in the UK and also for people who are just generally interested in citizen assemblies and their role. So the three kind of points that I wanted to raise are, are areas of challenge or maybe uh, contestation in uh, citizen assemblies and how they involve uh, in politics. So I'd say up to now in the UK, we've had a number of really amazing and interesting and innovative examples of uh, citizen assemblies being run across a whole range of different themes from climate to hate crime 
here in the UK, which have been variable levels of um, reported or known about. Um, and so that's my kind of first point that I make, and it's, it's, it's a reasonably obvious one, but I think it has some important implications, which is that there is this um, deliberative gap sometimes that can emerge between people who are either very politically engaged or understand the role or know about citizen assemblies at all, um, and then are people who also, and people who've been involved with them, and the wider public who often haven't heard even about a citizen assembly happening in their local community. And I think this um, is something that uh, I, I, I raise in the report, what Stu Professor Stuart White calls the deliberative gap, um, which is that in, in an event where we are focusing on sort of quality of discussion and therefore have fewer participants involved in this process, we run the risk that a, a, a bigger gap opens up between the participants who are involved in the process and the wider public who don't have that involvement. And I think that's something that has to be addressed both by the Citizens Assembly community and also by politicians and campaigners. You need to, if, if Citizens Assemblies are to play a wider role in our democracy, that get much better at talking about them publicly and addressing uh, the public directly about the role of Citizens Assemblies. Um, this has to be linked, linked to sort of the wider democratic themes of disaffection, alienation, um, kind of democratic turmoil we've seen in the UK, especially in the last five years. Um, and we know from our experience of focus groups as well, that when citizens who have never heard about citizen assemblies are introduced to them and explained, you know, what citizen assemblies are and how they work, they're generally very in favour of them. But the, the main issue that we're facing is that most people haven't heard of them and they don't know what they are. Also, the language matters here. So we know from recent polling and recent focus groups that Talking about randomly selected citizens often associates, you know, conjures up associations of people just being um, picked at, at random. A lot of people don't like that idea that you would just go and pick random people off the street. But when you explain that it's a kind of representative uh, sample of people and that they're people also just like you and me, people tend to warm up to that idea a bit more because they understand that citizens don't, in our current system, have an obvious in to policy making. So the second point to make about this is therefore then about the role of the politicians. And I think this is something that in the de deliberative democracy sector, we don't actually think about enough. So in talking to a number of people as part of this report, I think this idea that politicians will, ex will experience some sort of challenge through a citizen assembly process is really important to take on board. And by that, I mean that the most innovative and interesting politicians are often those who kind of commission certain assemblies and are very keen for, on them, but they often don't understand what their role is in this process. And here we have the, the broader kind of political question of where you're mixing two different kinds of mandates. So you've got representation and the representative model of democracy on the one hand, and on the other hand, you've got a deliberative model based on sortition, i.e. randomly selected citizen. And here you've got kind of competing authorities at play. So the politicians rightly will say things like, we already have a citizen assembly, it's, it's called parliament. I mean, they're not right in the sense that it's not a citizen assembly, but they're right insofar as they have been elected through a democratic process and they have a mandate to govern. And then on the other hand, you've got citizens who've been randomly selected in order to kind of better reflect the wider citizenry. And you've got the potential, uh, tension or friction involved in that, who actually ultimately calls the shots. And I think that's something that we as campaigners or also people involved in these spaces um, need to think more carefully about because there's a gentle process of kind of preparing the politicians for this role, walking them through the process, and then also giving them a, a strong lead in terms of the follow-up. So when politicians receive something from the citizen assembly that they, they take it as a little package, they understand where it's come from, and they know how to deal with it going forward. And I think that has been something that's been missing in the past few years, um, that follow-up process um, that people talk to, spoke to in the interviews about. I, I really like this quote from uh, David Van Raybrook, who's a, a, a strong proponent of citizen assemblies and has kind of um, kick-started the, sort of the Belgian process around this, where he talks about this tension between legitimacy and effectiveness in any model of governance. And so legitimacy on the one hand, you've got this, this, this gap in legitimacy here in the UK 
with questions around alienation and disaffection that we've spoken about. And so citizens don't feel that the government often represents their views. And on the other hand, you've got this question about effectiveness, like we have a day-to-day -day process of policy making, things need to get done, and citizens care about that as well. We know that from um, in-depth research and polling and focus groups. And a citizen assembly is a really interesting balance there because you've got a new model of legitimacy which comes directly from the citizens, but you've also got this question of actually it is effective when you bring citizens into these big decisions because they feel a sense of ownership over it. But then this follow-up process is really important because the politicians need to then go and implement the decisions from the citizen assembly. So we've talked about the public and we've talked about politicians. And then the final point I'd like to make, if we just draw out from the report, is that um, I think there's, a, as I see it um, in the space that we work in, people who are involved in democracy, there's often a space of campaigners over here. So um, I've worked in the past in roles which are more kind of campaign focused around specific democratic reforms, maybe around voting or uh, House of Lords reform or political participation in politics. And then on the other hand, we also have deliberative practitioners and facilitators. Now, I want to stress this world is quite small, <laughs> as evidenced by the fact that I've also worked in, in both spaces and they, these people tend to know each other. But actually, often there is a kind of sometimes a bit of a firewall between the two. That is for good reason, because campaigners are often campaigning for a specific political outcome. Say they want to change the voting system from first past the post to a more proportional system and to get rid of the House of Lords. And the democratic practitioners are really keen to set up processes that are obviously neutral with regard to outcome and thoughtful about how you facilitate and retain that neutrality. But I also think that there's an important conversation to be had between people in this space because it's important that the, the, the wider campaigns and the energy around campaigning for a better democracy also is connected to this idea of process. And I hope we'll hear from Alan in a second about also how research and also the role of academia in this can play in bridging those two divides. And that's the final point I wanted to end on is that citizen assemblies will only work when they have a connection to the wider democratic landscape. So even more contentiously than that, as a sort of progressive uh, campaigner and activist, I think it's something that we cannot afford to lose sight of, that the citizen assembly is not um, ever happening in isolation. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen outside of the political context that we're living in. And so things like inequality, economic inequality, political inequality, social inequality come into those spaces as well. Um, we've seen big gaps and big divides opening up in our country around issues like education levels. And we saw that around the Brexit vote, but also just people feeling connected to the political process. We have lots of people who feel disconnected, that their area or their demographic are not represented in politics. Citizen assemblies try to counteract that by by bringing in a more representative sample of people. But those people also exist in the wider uh, politics um, and the political environment we live in. So it's important to me that people who are advocating for and participating in citizen assemblies are also thoughtful about the wider context of politics and democracy um, in the UK right now. And I think that's a kind of contented, uh, contested space in lots of ways, um, because lots of people who are politically active understand that the, dem the democratic neutral space set up by a citizen assembly has to be free of party politics. But for me personally, I also think that there should be some context in which campaigners for a better kind of politics overall understand that citizen assemblies have a big role to play there. So those are the main points that I wanted to bring up from the report. Um, I'm really excited to hear people's questions from the audience and also obviously Alan's response to the report and those questions I raised. Thanks. Yeah, um, thank you, Francis. Um, you picked out really interesting points I think we can discuss. And um, Alan, I would like you to, to comment on the points that um, Francis brought up, uh, drawing from your experience that you have and from your research. Um, thank you, Johanna, uh, and thank you so much. It's great to be here today discussing uh, what I thought was a fantastic report, uh, really insightful and um, uh, stimulating and important for uh, getting us uh, thinking about uh, uh, these issues. Um, I, th I think I didn't disagree with anything that Francis has just said, so maybe I'm going to be a rather poor discussant. Um, I, mean, I, I think I took away 
similarly, I had in mind three kind of main takeaways that I had from the from from the report, which were um, perhaps organised around different kind of dimensions from um, what um, Francis has just uh, set out there. Um, so, I mean, the first point was simply the uh, the great potential value of citizens' assemblies to uh, 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 assist in in our democracy, uh, and I think you know that's. Um, while we're also thinking about some of the, the difficulties around citizens' assemblies, it's, it's really important to remember uh, that they um, do have great potential value in bringing people closer to democratic processes, um, hopefully bringing out the outcomes of those democratic processes closer to uh, considered public opinion um, on a range of different issues. Um, and then the second point uh, is that we also need to reflect carefully on how they how citizens' assemblies fit into the wider system, and that question of whether citizens' assemblies are intended to replace representative institutions or to help and to strengthen uh, the, the representative system. And then thirdly, there's a lot of uh, really important thinking in the report about how we think strategically uh, in order to advance citizens' assemblies, and we don't just kind of push, push, push for exactly the thing that we want when perhaps the, um, the uh, that will just raise hackles among those who have quite a lot of power to uh, prevent those things. So um, as Francis mentioned and Johanna mentioned, uh, I've been uh, doing a project recently looking at public opinion towards democracy in the UK, including towards uh, citizens' assemblies. So I thought it would be helpful just to say a little bit about some of the, the findings and indeed the process um, of that project. So we've done both a survey looking at public opinion uh, on democracy and a citizens' assembly as well. Um, and uh, the so in both of those, I won't talk about all of the findings, but just, just particularly relating to citizens' assemblies. So the survey very much confirms what uh, Francis has just said, that there is um, broad public support uh, for citizens' assemblies. So we asked a question, we described what a citizens' assembly is, and then we asked a question about whether people thought that would be a good idea. And 54% said that they would support the idea um, of having citizens' assemblies against only 15% who said that they would oppose that idea. Francis mentioned the fact that lots of people just don't know. Um, and I think that's also a really important point. So we have 31% who either say they neither support nor oppose or say they don't know. Um, so clearly there are lots of people, even once you have a little description of what a citizens' assembly is, who don't yet feel that they're able to express um, a view of, on this issue. Um, we also asked about different ways of using citizens' assemblies. And it was very clear that um, there was strongest support for a citizens' assembly whose proposals go to parliament for decision. And there was weakest support for a citizens' assemblies whose proposals automatically become law. Uh, so <clears throat> um, while 54% to 15% 15, 15 was the, the support for citizens' assemblies in general, when we think about a citizens' assembly whose proposals automatically become law, then it go, that goes down to 33% support, 32% opposition. So um, uh, there isn't majority support there. Um, and we also asked about support for citizens' assemblies in our citizens' assembly, which you might think is a kind of curious meta sort of a thing to do, in which we're running a process of a citizens' assembly, but also we need to be neutral about whether, whether a citizens' assembly is a good idea in order that people can, can um, think through that, that question. So it kind of gets at some of those tensions that um, Francis was talking about there in the third point. Um, but I think, nevertheless, the the outcomes from the citizens' assembly on the attitudes to citizens' assemblies are important and worth uh, seeing. So we found 90% of the members supported wider use of citizens' assemblies, um, particularly on important divisive issues. Um, they thought that citizens' assemblies, official ones, so ones set up by parliaments, governments, and so on, should have impact, there should be some kind of guarantee that the recommendations will be made public, uh, there'll be some kind of detailed response from the convening body, there'll be parliamentary debate. Um, and they talked about particular uses of citizens' assemblies around when government proposes laws that were not in its manifesto, uh, on local issues as well as national issues, that MPs should be able to use, not necessarily citizens' assemblies, which are very big processes, but deliberative processes. Um, uh, locally in their constituencies um, before they decide how to vote on controversial issues. Um, but at the same time, 
85% of the members backed the recommendation that the results of a deliberative process like a citizens assembly should provide advice to policymakers, but should not be binding, uh, as that would be undemocratic since the members are not elected. So again, getting that to that question of how citizens assemblies should relate to the, the broader representative process. Um, and I think through this, this survey and the citizens assembly, we can also kind of see people's underlying reasoning for why, for firstly, why they are cautious about giving citizens assemblies actual decision making power. And basically the answer to why they're cautious on that is accountability, they care about accountability. So in the survey, we got people to rank different components of democracy and um, the, the component that if those in power do a poor job, they can be voted out came top. Uh, the second one was who holds power is decided by free and fair elections. So people really value accountability. Um, but they also want citizens assemblies to have a role uh, because they want basically the system to be more responsive to what people like them think. Uh, and that again came through in many of our survey questions and in the citizens assembly as well. So, um, so people in general are, are um, they want, they're positive about uh, deliberative processes, uh, and uh, sorry, more positive about deliberative processes than they are about about referendums. So they want um, public involvement, but they want kind of deliberative, considered public involvement, um, so far as possible. Um, and that kind of makes sense, you know. Um, people um, uh, want want the system to be more responsive, um, but they. Um, so, so they see citizens' assemblies as one mechanism for that, but they also want to have kind of ultimate control through the, the mechanism of election. Uh, and I guess they see a danger that if you empower citizens' assemblies too much, then you risk giving too much power to the organizers of citizens' assemblies, and that can be problematic. So uh, as Francis said, and as the report uh, discusses in detail, the question is how can you get the existing system to take the recommendations of a citizens assembly seriously um, and so there are some interesting ideas in the report around requiring uh, regular progress reviews of the recommendations that the implementation of recommendations or at least consideration of implementation of recommendations coming out of a citizens assembly um, we've just seen in scotland the first example in the uk of a citizens assembly that has been able to reconvene uh, um, after the government had responded to its initial report in order to res respond to that re that response, if you like, and uh, give the politicians a bit of a, a kick to uh, to try harder, uh, as, as, as they did. This is the uh, Scottish uh, uh, Climate Assembly. But I think most fundamentally, there needs to be a kind of expectation uh, that politicians and officials will take citizens' assembly recommendations seriously, so they won't necessarily implement them but they'll take them seriously and that there's some kind of political cost therefore to them not doing so. And I think we can see that that's beginning to happen in Ireland. Uh, perhaps we're also beginning to get there in Scotland. There's, you know, there's a, a sense that citizens assemblies are valuable things. Um, they make positive contributions and we should listen. So I think the most important and fundamental question is, well, how do we develop that kind of culture, that kind of expectation? around citizens' assemblies. And there are lots of people here who are much more expert on that than I am. So I shall stop there with that question. Um, yeah, thank you, Alan. You uh, touched upon quite a few things um, uh, that would advance citizens' assemblies, develop them or strengthen them um, in various areas, I would say. And, um, uh, perhaps before we get to the questions, um, I, I'm just trying to, to structure the debate a bit. I find it um, because you've also mentioned um, or addressed the problem of the deliberative gap that Francis, you brought up as your first point. Um, and I found that very interesting because if, if you say they are not, um, citizens assemblies are also perhaps not very well known in the British uh, and Irish um, public then perhaps also the attitude uh, towards them uh, is not what it would really be like if there were more information out there. 
And um, because there also was the question if, whether uh, other European countries have tried out citizens' assemblies, I found one um, particular comparison very interesting. That was the comparison of the UK citizens' assembly on the climate change, on climate change, and that the same one on in France that took basically uh, place in the, in the same year. And where uh, polls in France, because they uh, also set up the assembly to be a bit, you know, a bit dif different, was that um, after um, the assembly had taken place, there were polls that showed that more than 70% of the Fran French population knows now what a citizen assembly is. Uh, and that was also due to the fact that um, the participants were way more encouraged than the UK ones were to talk to the media, to basically to um, bridge the gap that Francis, you addressed. Um, and I was just wondering what you um, think about this, both, I mean, Francis and Alan, because from what I've learned, is it, there, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to this. The advantage is certainly you, you get the media coverage, you get people interested, um, and uh, that bridges the gap. The p potential disadvantage that I see is that um, the people, um, participants get more exposed and they, then they, once they're in the public eye, um, you also give way to potential of external influence on the, of the participants. Uh, and once citizens' assemblies have become more established and perhaps also seen as a bit more powerful, then it's not difficult to see the lobby industry dedicating some efforts of you know, informing the participants in between sessions in their own way. And um, so I was wondering, what, what, how do you see this dilemma? Do you see any, um, any dilemma in this or how would you deal with it? Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating question. I, I'm always really, uh, I've been very interested in, in that because I see the potential of, um, so I think storytelling, and there's a bit in the report which addresses this, is this uh, um, a small section about storytelling, how citizen assemblies have been made real to people. What's the, how do you, how do you fire the public's imagination around what this is as well? So it's not just a kind of dry procedural policymaking process, which is, you know, not that interesting to people, but it's actually something which is like, this is citizens from all walks of life and all backgrounds sitting down and making a decision together about something important. Now, that's fascinating and interesting to people, especially when it's an issue, and I talk about this in the report as well, of political salience. So it's an issue of relevance to people. And I think this is why I would say there is a difference between, in a way, uh, my report, halfway through, I was thinking, why am I covering Britain and Ireland in the, in the same report? Because they are in very different places on this. I mean, um, the Republic of Ireland, I, I, I would imagine, you know, much more similar to the French population in terms of also knowing about civil assemblies, understanding their role in policymaking, just because they've had many high profile civil assemblies that have been involved in big landmark decisions, such as around um, abortion and equal marriage. And so to me, that, me that story telling aspect of it is really important. And I always recommend the, the you know, amazing short documentary, which I do again in the report of When Citizens Assemble, um, which is just a 15 minute documentary about the, the, the um, Irish Citizens Assembly on abortion, which I think really, it, it's it's just it's, it sparks that imagination because you can see different assembly members telling their experience of the session and you know is it is in parts quite moving people saying things like when i got here i didn't know why i'd been chosen but then i understood that i had some experience or expertise to share and i think that's what really captures it for some people that's why people get excited about citizen assemblies because they can see both the you know the potential impact on the wider political landscape but also importantly on the people who take part i think that's just as important a reason for running a citizen assembly is to give participants this sense that you know they are politically active citizens whose opinions and experience and expertise matter not just their voice as is often talked about but actually their expertise and experience like you have stuff to share that we as you know political representatives want to know about your experience and also you're able to make these important significant decisions you know, it matters that you're here in the room. And I think there's there's no other process I can think of in politics that gives citizens that same sense of integrity and significance. I mean, going to cast a ballot can be moving for people, but it's not quite the same as being deeply involved in this policy setting process. But to come back to the, the tension, I mean, I do know that in Ireland, they were offered quite a bit of media training, people who wanted to talk to the press about particularly this issue. Um, and I think that is a question that, 
for me, in my mind, around the idea of institutionalizing standing citizen assemblies. So, for example, in Ostbegian or like in other places which are looking at that model, there's a question about people becoming institutionalized. So what you always say is, yes, politicians are demographically unrepresentative people, but they're also human beings and human beings in general, when you become part of an institution, you do become institutionalized. And you know you then are more kind of incentivized to be defensive of the institution that gives you that power. So what I mean by that is once you get people into these institutions, often they you know go through the same process of becoming like a politician as everybody else does. So there's that question for me about the institutionalization of these and also their vulnerability to lobbying. But I think when they're one-off processes, I think that as long as there's good protection and support around people who are going into the media to discuss often quite sensitive issues like abortion, then I think that it's a very good thing because it can give, it also gives profile and voice to people who have actually had the experience themselves and often better place to explain why it was so, you know, beneficial and transformative. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. So I won't, I won't repeat it. Just to add one other thought. Um, I mean, I think the if you're thinking about the visibility of a particular citizens assembly, then the main factor is how influential is the citizens assembly going to be? So, um, you know, is it actually going to be taken seriously by government? Is government actually going to uh, l listen to the findings? And I think, you know, the, the media looking at the climate assembly in the UK thought this has been set up by some parliamentary committees. It's not clear that there's a, a route to power for, for for this citizens assembly, and therefore the the attention was a bit lower. I mean, it wasn't zero by any means. There was some uh, significant and really valuable coverage, and indeed there has been valuable impact uh, since that assembly. Uh, some of which Frances mentions in her report, um, but the the path was a bit harder for people to see there. Um. We have a couple of questions in the in the chat or in the Q and A, and um, there were two questions that are um, uh, that go in, in a very similar direction, and that about that are questions more about the fundamentals, uh, fundamental understanding of citizens assembly. So that's why I would like to uh, let those two people ask them first. Um, I think they're quite similar, so it would either be Tanet U three A or um, Robina Jacobson about the selection of the members of the assembly and the more logistical proceedings. Could you unmute them? Hi. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, I wondered if, um, thank you for this. I wondered if you could explain a bit more about the um, selection mechanism. How do you choose members of an assembly and how many citizens comprise an assembly and who directs their work? I mean, how do, how do they know where to start really? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and um, if you could also please just um, address this one additional issue that was addressed by Planet, that was the reimbursement um, that also, I think, belongs to the logistical questions. Uh, I don't know if well, Francis or Alan, you've both worked on, I think it's a very practical I'm question. I'm going to let Alan go first on this one because he's been deeply involved in the selection mechanisms. I could answer those questions in the abstract, but maybe you can say a bit more specific. <laughs> so, um... The goal is that you have a genuinely representative cross-section of the population. Um, in order to achieve that, the standard approach these days in the UK at least, is that you randomly select uh, lots of addresses from the, the postcode uh, database uh, and you write it, send invitation letters to those addresses. Um, so you, you, know, you send out many, many thousands of uh, invitations. You will get back hopefully some hundreds of expressions of interest. And then you um, go through a process of um, recruiting from those people who express their interest in a way to get a representative sample of the population. Because of course, the people who express an interest are not going to be entirely representative of the wider uh, population. They're more likely to be male, they're more likely to be more educated, and so on. So you need to compensate for those kinds of 
uh, inequalities and who responds. So you get back to these people uh, um, who've expressed their interest uh, in order to recruit a genuinely representative sample. And of course, you need to be thinking about exactly on what criteria you're um, uh, defining representativeness, but certainly in terms of gender and age and ethnic background and you know various uh, characteristics, characteristics like that. And probably also in most cases, you want to uh, use some kind of uh, indicator relating to political attitudes. We know that people um, with more uh, progressive attitudes are more likely to accept the invitation to it. So again, you have to be careful to get a representative sample there. Um, in terms of, and then and then you go through a careful process with those people to onboard them uh, is the uh, phrase that's often used in order to ensure that they're comfortable, they understand what um, involvement in the citizens assembly is, that they can take part, they have uh, the resources. So um, uh, if if you're doing an online assembly as we've just done, then you make sure that they have. They, they can, they're able to get online, all that kind of thing. So again, you're ensuring that there are no barriers. So you're trying to take away as many barriers as you possibly can to people taking part. Um, that relates to the, the question about reimbursement. So yes, you do um, uh, pay people a gift, uh, as we normally describe it, for, for taking part, which would be uh, sort of 100, 150, 200 pounds per weekend, uh, something in that kind of order normally. Um, in terms of the number of, uh, and I should also say, there's also of course support for if people have extra caring responsibilities and they need to be able to um, make, make special arrangements in order to take part, then generally there will be support for that as well. If it's a face-to-face -face assembly, then of course if you, you cover people's travel costs, uh, hotel accommodation and so on. In terms of the number of members, a citizens' assembly, so normally around about 100 members in a citizens' assembly. The one that we've just done was slightly smaller because we had quite a small budget. Um, so uh, you can do a citizens' assembly down around sort of 50 members. That's, that's still, I would regard as being a perfectly legitimate uh, citizens' assembly process. And part of the important thing with the size is that you can kind of mix things up as you go along within the assembly. There's always a danger if you're meeting over several weekends that you develop a little bit of group think and people start to know, know which, what, it, what each other thinks. And so just um, mixing up the groups uh, that, that people are working in within the assembly from weekend to weekend helps to ensure that, uh, that you don't get that group think developing. Um, which relates to the question of uh, how you actually direct the, the work. So, um, it's always very important to be working with uh, professionals in the design and facilitation of these kinds of processes. So in our citizens assembly that we've just done, we work with Involve, um, who are uh, have been involved in a lot of the UK citizens assemblies and have great experience and expertise in doing this. And there are a number of other organisations that uh, do it as well. So um, most of the time when the members are deliberating among themselves, they are talking in small groups with a facilitator in order to ensure that they keep on track, that the conversation uh, remains um, respectful uh, and so on. Uh, but also there are, there are plenary sessions when uh, there's, uh, uh, there are expert speakers and witnesses who are able to give their kind of expertise and experience uh, to the process. So um, it, it, the deliberative process is very much one where um, uh, uh, you're allowing people the chance to learn and reflect. Uh, so through a combination of plenary sessions with uh, expert witnesses and also discussion uh, in small groups as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, Francis, do you have anything to add to this or? I think I think I just covered it pretty, pretty comprehensively. Happy to, to move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so they have, so that's more about the, the procedure and the logistics, how um, citizens assembly run. And we've also addressed um, what should be done with the recommendations that come out of the citizens assembly. And there have been two questions on basically the, how, how to integrate them into the um, system, the current political system. So there was one question by uh, Stuart White. Would you like to ask this? Hello. 
Uh, yes, thank, uh, thanks to Francis and to Alan uh, for their uh, terrific presentations. Uh, yeah, I wanted to come back to this question of how hypothetically a citizens' assembly might, or citizens' assemblies might fit into the wider political system, and in particular with referendums. So on the one hand, um, I can imagine an argument that says that citizens' assemblies should have the power to put their proposals to a referendum because that's one way of handling the, the, the problem of governments or elected legislatures not acting seriously on, on their proposals. Um, but I can also think of an argument for saying that um, maybe elected politicians shouldn't have a power to call referendums without that first somehow going through the filter of a citizen's assembly, in effect, giving a citizen's assembly the power to decide if there is a referendum on an issue and maybe what the question is. Um, because I think in the UK case, I, I would certainly argue that in recent years, we've seen uh, elected politicians call referendums essentially for reasons of you know, managing their own parties. Um, uh, and those referendum processes not being uh, particularly uh, uh, particularly good in in democratic terms. Um, uh, but I guess this, if, if there is this role between citizens' assemblies or this relationship between citizens' assemblies and referendums, it, it also points up the issue of the the deliberative gap that that Francis started with. So, any thoughts on 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 that? God, yeah, this is a difficult one. <laughs> I find I find this is a really difficult one. And um, but thanks to Stuart for asking it because I, I do think this is a challenging one, especially, especially in the con you know, it goes back to my point of these things don't happen in a vacuum. And um, you know, just a slight aside point is that then a lot of people are coming at this um conversation about citizen assemblies versus referendum in the context of recent experience around Brexit. Um, and I think that is in some respects helpful because we can see, you know, as, as you said, Stuart, I think most people in the democracy sector, regardless of how they voted or what they wanted to happen, think that that process for democracy was kind of bruising, whatever way you want to look at it. It was, it was a sort of bruising process uh, and left a lot of people, regardless of how they voted, feeling, you know, that it was that, that it was a it was a tough time <laughs> to 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 be to be politically active and to have those conversations and left a lot of people with kind of divisions um, that that perhaps could have been approached in a different way, um, and I think refer referendums are quite a blunt instrument. Um, I think they have their role within the arsenal of kind of political mechanisms and tools. But I think, as you say, that Stuart, that actually the way that I've been approaching this and talking to people about it in the last few years is that they actually are very complementary mechanisms um, because what you've got in the, in the form of referendum is a mass def democratic exercise with a very clear question. I mean, regardless of how you voted it on Brexit, um, there was this idea that lots of people could participate in this question. Um, the problem about that is, <laughs> The question itself might have seemed clear on the outset, the implications of it weren't necessarily clear. And so for me, there's a question about whether the Citizen Assembly also sits in advance of the referendum and helps set the question, or whether also it comes after, or you know, maybe even both, to help process the response. Because also what you had following the Brexit vote is this question of, okay, well, what does actually Brexit look like? What does it mean to leave the EU? What should we prioritize in that process? And that is obviously then citizens then uh, come in for a specific moment in time, given a snapshot view, but also not been asked for any further engagement on that, which is also where you've got a lot of, you know, turmoil in the country politically, also within parliament as well, about trying to deliver on what it means to deliver on that vote. So we all can see what can happen when you run these processes badly, but I also think where you saw the media picking up on this um, question of citizen assemblies more interestingly recently was post Brexit looking across the island and saying well hang on we a lot of people got animated and interested in the referendums in, in Ireland around abortion and equal marriage but they were preceded by citizen assemblies something a lot of people didn't know and I think that's what's interesting is to tie these two things together and say 
what citizen assembly offer is this slow, thoughtful, deliberative um, space in which citizens can think through prioritization and trade off. And I talk a lot about that in the report. If it's not dealing with crunchy, often quite detail orientated things, um, which, which require you to think quite uh, flexibly about priorities, like dialing this up and dialing this down, a little bit of this, a little less of this, or is this more important than this, rather than this or this, it gets citizens to be thinking in a less binary way. So I see the two as being complementary, and I think we should have a more public conversation about the fact that it's not a pro-referendum or pro citizen assembly, it's about how these things go about, and crucially, how they slot back into also our broader democratic landscape, of what the role of parliament is in this. So all the bits need to fit together, and I suppose my, my report also argues for that connected tissue to be sort of made up by democratic campaigners and, and people who are involved in, in these sorts of processes to be linking these things together a bit more rather than happening in parallel or you know actually at odds with one another. Yeah, this is a great question. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's really complicated, I think. So we've seen uh, citizens' assemblies being used really effectively in advance of referendums in Ireland. So the, the Irish model is one where the citizens' assembly is used in the the process of working out what the proposal put to a referendum is. And that's been, that's, as Francis said, that's worked very effectively on those particular issues. Um, another way of using citizens' assemblies, which I think, to me, it would be a good idea on a referendum on any issue at all, would be what happens in Oregon, where um, uh, a deliberative process, not a full-scale citizens' assembly, but a smaller, more like a citizens' jury type thing, takes place during the campaign or early in the campaign, uh, and offers a kind of reflection on the, the the arguments and what people make of the arguments once they've had a chance to to think about them, and that's a way of improving the quality of information during the campaign. And I think you can you can think of ways in which you could develop the Oregon model quite, quite interestingly in order to. Uh, provide better quality um, uh, information and reflection on the information being provided by campaigners in the course of a campaign. On the other hand, if you think of um, the referendums that are most likely to take place in the UK anytime soon, Scottish independence, Irish unification, um, how do you do a referendum, uh, a citizens assembly? <laughs> yeah, so I think you can do that second type of citizens assembly. Uh, very, very well in, in those sorts of contexts. Um, I mean, Sinn Féin has been campaigning for a while in Northern Ireland and in the Republic, indeed, that there should be uh, a, a citizens' assembly in order to kind of prepare the way for a, a unification referendum. But the trouble with that is unionists are not going to take part, or at least you're not. You might get a bunch of people who are unionists who decide to sign up for whatever reason, but they're not going to be representative of unionist opinion. It's not, and it's going to become very divisive. And there's a danger with that kind of proposal that it just discredits the idea of citizens' assemblies. Indeed, to some extent, it's already done that uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and similarly in Scotland, you know, you can't have a citizens' assembly on whether to have a referendum on independence, or you can't have a citizens' assembly on. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't do a citizens' assembly to kind of decide the model of independence. It's just too big a question. You can't possibly give that to a citizens' assembly. So quite how you use these sorts of deliberative processes in some of these deeply divisive uh, fundamental constitutional questions is something that I haven't yet got my head around. Um, but I think we do need to do more thinking about. And just add one more thing to that. It, the political will has to be there. Like the the, the government has to, in good faith call the citizen assembly and actually listen to what they say you know that seems like a really obvious point to make but this is why i say that also campaigning for and around citizen assemblies in democratic form needs to take account of the government at the time what its agenda is what it is planning to do and be kind of actually quite switched on about that otherwise you set up you know a citizen assembly to fail um or a, or a government can call it actually for quite cynical means in order to kind of give itself political cover to do something you want it to do anyway you know, the, these are all questions that have to fit back into the landscape of, of where the, the country is currently at that's calling us the assembly. Yeah, yeah, and it's really important that if you do a citizen assembly, you really think hard about how you exactly formulate the question, the topic, how you narrow it down and how you implement it. Otherwise, it could go really backwards, it could really backfire your, your purpose.
Um, we have um, another question that's more uh, on the political system um, by Laurie Morten Ulrich. Uh, would you like to pose this? Um, yes, my question was was really to Alan's point about, about accountability. At, at what point does a overall system, uh, if it loses its legitimacy, which means the election options really don't provide an alternative and people feel their vote doesn't really count because regardless if they vote, particularly in the, the UK with the first past the post, uh, the majority of votes actually don't count. Um, at what point does this accountability, you know, excuse really a paper ta tiger? And did, did any, did people in your survey uh, express any um, concerns or misgivings to that point? Yeah, thank you, Laurie. It's a really important point. Um, in the survey, no, because <laughs> there wasn't a question through which they might have uh, expressed that. But of course, in the Citizens' Assembly, one of the advantages of Citizens' Assemblies is that you get much richer uh, understanding of opinion. And yeah, people were really concerned in both the survey and the Citizens' Assembly that, that account accountability is fundamental and those who make decisions must be accountable. Um, but what we saw in the Citizens' Assembly very clearly was that they are very concerned that current mechanisms of accountability in the UK aren't good enough. Um, we didn't get into the electoral system uh, in the Citizens' Assembly because um, we had six weekends, which sounds like a lot of time, but uh, actually, you know, there's only so much you can cover in even six weekends and hope to uh, give it any kind of serious consideration. Um, but certainly I, we, we were aware that there, there was, uh, certainly among some members of the assembly, there was a, a desire to think about uh, electoral systems. Uh, so that would be something that many people would want, I think, uh, a future citizens assembly to focus in on. Um, and, and there was a lot of concern that the representative system as a whole, so not just thinking about elections, but also thinking about the degree of connection between voters and their representatives, um, uh, uh, it just isn't working uh, as effectively as it should. Um, so yeah, uh, citizens' assemblies, uh, petitions, you know, a variety of other mechanisms were seen by members as ways of helping to bridge those kinds of gaps. But I, I wouldn't pretend that the assembly came up with uh, ultimate solutions to those problems. Yeah, thanks. That's a pity, though. Um, um, we have two questions that also may perhaps go in a little bit in a similar direction. There was one from Kali um, to ask whether these assemblies have been tried out in other European countries and how they um, perhaps have been created, have created a link to a mainstream setups. And then Torsten asked, um, uh, when will citizens assemblies in Ireland and the UK be institutionalized, as it was done in East Belgium? So uh, perhaps you could combine these two questions. Um, and because we are uh, almost to the end of our event, I, I hope it's okay if I just summarize these two questions and, and um, yeah, pass them on to you. What do you think of, of this model? Yeah, so um, both interesting questions which relate to the, the latter kind of, the, the latter section of my report, which looks kind of the future of, of certain assemblies. Um, I mean, I think also, <laughs> to some degree, the two questioners could answer each other. So I know that Tawaston is, is, is well involved in, in, in European citizen assemblies and perhaps can post some information about that in the chat. Um, so that would be great. Um, uh, and I think what's interesting is, is to see that development of institutionalization and what direction it takes. What that opens up for me, which is something I raised in the report, is actually there's a bit of, there's not, there's not a, I would say, consensus in the deliberative democracy sector about that being a desirable direction of travel. And or, or rather, I think there's a lot to work out in that. Um, some people in the deliberative democracy sector are very pro that agenda and see that it's the natural kind of evolution of certain assemblies that they will become institutionalized. Um, other people have 
more skepticism about that. I think that skepticism is 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 probably falls into two to two uh, to two streams. One is the desirability of it. So some people are, are concerned a bit, like your point, Johanna, you, earlier about uh, about co-option or about institutionalization, and they're worried that this will just you know set up a different structure which will become equally. Uh, um, kind of concentration of power and potentially citizens, also how they would interact with uh, the, the elected members of the representative systems, I think is a really interesting question. And also uh, that question of uh, whether you can tack on a deliberative, uh, a deliberative model to a fundamentally representative model. I think that is a really crucial question that needs to be talked about publicly. And actually to be, um, made more accessible for everybody to think about. So when we talk about democracies and when you say democracy to a lot of people, um, or you, you know, you know, it's an absolute scandal to me that we don't have any political education as part of our curriculum in the UK, like not once in any of my school education to people to teach me anything about political terms or how our system works. You know, that's not true in a lot of countries, but it is true in the UK. That's scandalous and needs to change. But also when you say, when you say democracy to people, a lot of people will say voting. And actually, you know, the point that a lot of deliberative experts are trying to make and campaigners is democracy is just it's not just about voting. It's also about being an active citizen in lots of ways and feeling that you have a stake and a power in the system to change decisions and that you should be part of that decision making of your country. And I think that's where we need to shift the conversation in a more imaginative way. And what these questions about institutionalization and about the future of the assembly show up is exactly this question. What is democracy to people? And I think the project that Alan's helped lead um, surfaces a lot of these questions. But you know, the, the argument that I would make is, can we, can we think more laterally about this? Um, because actually our you know, system of governance as it is right now, is it, it has not been the system for you know it's actually a very short amount of time that we have this sort of mass democratic voting with a, a very particular media environment um it's people take it as given that we have political parties and elections and all of these things but i would say one final thing about that is people take it as a given more in the uk than they do in other places um partly because we have had a, quite a stable parliamentary democracy for a long time which obviously has a lot of benefits but it also makes people, I think, less imaginative and less thoughtful about what kinds of different kinds of democracy could look like. And I think, unfortunately, also around the world, you're seeing right now these questions about what does dem democracy mean from conversations about Ukraine to conversations about the future of the US. You know, you're getting more people to be animated by that and be thinking more clearly about what does what do we really mean when we talk about democracy. And I think those conversations need to be folded back into citizen assemblies. Sorry, Alan, I gave you not very much time there. <laughs> But that, that that would be my broad spoke answer. You probably have better answer to, to the, the future of institutionalization. Uh, I, I doubt it very much. I mean, of course, there's a question about what institutionalization means. So, and the Ostbelgian model is one version where you have a kind of standing assembly that uh, is able to um, uh, select topics for, um, for specific uh, assemblies. Um, I mean, I guess I understand institutionalization simply to mean that the use of citizens' assemblies becomes something that is normal and standardized uh, in some kind of way. Uh, and the Scottish government is uh, much further on than any other part of the UK in thinking about how to do that and how to um, how to use citizens' assemblies systematically in the future. Um, so I think that's well worth uh, looking at. But you can only do that and you can only make progress in that direction if there's a general view that citizens' assemblies are good uh, and that they can contribute positively to, to our democracy. And I think at UK-wide level, we're not quite there yet. Um, so we kind of need to walk before we run on that one. And we need to demonstrate that citizens' assemblies can be effective in dealing with challenging issues and can help politicians uh, deal with challenging issues. Because if we can't do that, then I don't think we're going to get that kind of base level of acceptance of citizens assemblies that is needed in order to make progress. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I think also the, the very last topic that we've just had is also um, a very good one, basically to close the debate because it looks a bit into the future of what we could potentially do with um, this instrument of citizens assembly for our democracy.
Um, yeah, so thank you very much for your debate. I'm, I'm afraid we didn't, didn't get to all the questions in, in the Q&A, but I hope you um, also took a lot of good tips and links from the chat so you can inform yourself even more. And thank you very much for the debate. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks to the FES. And thanks, Joanna, for moderating. <laughs>